each of you out this morning, uh, if you're visiting with us, we're thankful that you've been able to be here as well. Acts chapter 20 is where I want to read from this morning. Acts chapter 20. The burden of my heart this morning is uh, to help us to do some self-inspection today. I know we've got revival starting, Lord willing, next Sunday, and uh, we say that, but it won't be a revival unless the Lord sends revival. And he's ready and willing to send revival. Uh, but he is uh, looking to us to, you know, to get our hearts in condition. And uh, so this morning, it's not just because we got revival coming up that we try to preach this, but yet it's on my heart and uh, it's something that the Lord has really been dealing with me about. And I trust today that, again, that we can inspect ourselves and that uh, the Word of God can speak to us this morning. Acts chapter 20. Uh, before I read, we'll begin reading in verse 17, but before I read, that, uh, I want to just give us a brief introduction or summary of or background of what we have here. That uh, This is Paul near the end of his third missionary journey, and as he was make his way back to Jerusalem, that he would pass near the city of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was a place that he had spent three years ministering to those people. You can go back and you can read that earlier in the book of Acts. And uh, he came very close to Ephesus. He didn't go into the city, but uh, he came very close to the city of Miletus. And while he was there, that the elders of Ephesus came out there to meet him. And they, they spoke. And what we want to read this, this morning is the conversation that they had, uh, beginning in verse 17. He'll go back through his time there with them. He'll speak to them of some things that were happening at that time. And then he'll warn them of some things that would take place. Uh, later on, and he'll pour his heart out to them. But beginning in verse 17 of Acts chapter 20, it says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come, come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch, and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God, and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And that pretty much ends the... The, the words that he had for them, he'd go on and speak of the fact that uh, it came time for him to leave and that they would all weep sore and that they would sorrow. It said that not all, only for the words that he spoke, but also that for the word that they, they would no longer see him. That he, he made the statement to them that, that, uh, that they would see his face no more. I believe the Lord had showed him that. But I want to go back and, and look at some statements that were made. I'm not going to try to deal with a lot of what I read this morning. But I want to go back and look at some statements that are made 
uh, back in verse 18, as Paul, as he uh, recounts in his mind the time that he had spent with these dear people, he would make the statement in verse 18, he said, you know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I had been with you at all seasons. First thing I want to point out to you here is, is he said, ye know. He doesn't say, I know. That I know uh, 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 concerning my attitude and concerning uh, my motives and the manner that I've been with you at all seasons. But he said, you know. He said, you've observed. Uh, you've watched. You've seen my life. And he said, you've not only seen me one day or another day, but he said, you've seen me from the very first day. He said, you've seen me the manner I came to you that day, and you've seen me at all times. He said, it wasn't just that first day that I came unto you, but he said, it was every day that I was with you. Those entire three years, he said that I've been consistent. And he wasn't saying this in a boastful manner. He was getting a point across to them. He's just letting them know. He'd make this statement later on. He said that I'm pure from the blood of all men because he said, I'm not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. But Paul was a man that served the Lord with consistency. He wasn't up one day and, and down the next. He wasn't faithful for a time and then you didn't see him anymore. But he was consistent. He said, I've been that way all the time. And then he described that. He said in verse 19, how was he, how was he with them from the first day through all seasons? He said this, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which fell, befell me by lying in wait of the Jews. He described three things here to us, or, or at least listed those things. He said, I've served the Lord, number one, with humility of mind. I've not seen myself as, as important, but I've seen that, that you're important. I've seen that the Word of God is important. And I've humbled myself before you. And not only that, he said, I've, I have served the Lord with many tears. With many tears. And then he also would make the statement that I've served the Lord uh, with humility of mind, with many tears. And he said, there's been a lot of adversity. He said, there's been a lot of trouble. And he said, that trouble came by the lying in wait of the Jews. Now drop down to verse 31. Notice this as he gets toward the end of his conversation with them. He, speaking of the things that would come to pass after he was gone. He said, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. He said every day Night and day, he said, I've warned you, and I've not just warned you, but he said, I've warned you with tears. Do you believe that Paul gave it all that he had? Do you believe Paul's heart was in, in his work? I believe it's evident today that, that, that he had a burden for these people. That he'd make this statement, he said, serve the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears. And he'd make the statement in verse 31, that the, by the space of three years... He said, I've ceased not to warn you. And he said, I've done that with tears. I've done that because you have been on my heart. Now, when you think about the Apostle Paul, I guess there's nobody, that, no missionary that we read about in the Scriptures that did any greater work than what he did. But what I want us to see this morning is this man was a man of tears, wasn't he? Apostle Paul was a man of tears. And I don't believe that these tears were just tears that were manufactured just to try to manipulate somebody. I've been around people like that, and you have too. And that's not what I'm preaching this morning. And uh, in fact, it's the furthest thing from what I'm preaching. I've seen people that could turn them off and turn them on at the drop of a hat. And I'm going to tell you something. I've got no confidence in that. I don't have any confidence in it. That's not what Paul did. He didn't do it to try to make himself look good in the eyes of people. He didn't make, it, he didn't make himself cry in order to, to, to try to get their sympathy or to try to, to make them believe that he was something that he wasn't. But I believe that he cried from a heart that was burdened. These tears were shed from a man that was burdened about some people. I want to just try to deal with some very personal things this morning. And uh, I, hope that, uh, I hope that the attitude and, the, the, way, and, the, and the, the means in which I get it across will come across the right way to you. Now, 
Wednesday night was a week ago. Those of you that were here, I had intended on teaching. And uh, I had intended on just continuing on through there in First John, or the Gospel of John chapter 14. And uh, as the afternoon went by, that more and more, the Lord impressed upon my heart that we just need to have a prayer meeting. We just have prayer service. And those of you that were here, you know that's what we did. That we spent some time and I, I tried to uh, just help us to see that, that we need to pray for spiritual things. And I know we pray for those that are sick. That, that, that's good. And those that's lost loved ones, we need to pray for them. But uh, the most important needs are spiritual needs. And, and many of you spoke up with requests and things that were on your heart. And then we just spent some time. Those of you, I asked those of you that would like to, you could come down here to the front. And we'd just kneel down and pray. And I don't believe there's any power in this. You've heard me say that before, that uh, I can't take the Bible and find that there's an altar. In the New Testament church, I don't believe this is an altar. The altar's in our heart. That's where Christ dwells. This is the sacrifice of our heart that God sees. But many of you came down here and, and you knelt down. And, and I, may, I may have made, made this statement last Sunday that I think it's good sometimes, even the posture of our prayer, that we humble ourselves before God. That He's a holy God and we can't come to Him on our own. That we've got a great high priest, Jesus Christ. And it's through Him that we go to the Father. But as many of you came down and we began to pray, and uh, I, I just made the statement I, that called on someone to start, and, and you feel led to pray, if, you, if you'd like to, you pray. And then I would close the prayer. But as we were praying that night, there was something that hit me like a ton of bricks. And I made mention of it at the end of the service. And, uh, and, and I tell you what, it did. It, it shocked me. Uh, it opened uh, my eyes. And uh, that was just simply this, that as pastor of the church, I ought to be the spiritual leader of this church. That's what God's called me to do. He's called me to be the, the example. And uh, that you ought to be able to follow me as I follow the Lord. And as, as, I, as I kneeled there and I, and I prayed, what hit me so hard was this. I didn't even come close to shedding a tear. I'm just going to be honest with you tonight. Didn't even come close. And I tell you what, the Lord got my attention. He got my attention. Like, my attention hadn't been gotten in a long time. And I tell you what, I left there, I left here that night burdened about myself because I couldn't even cry. I couldn't even shed a tear over those that's lost. And some of those that's lost is my own children. And it's your children. And it's people here that, that come and that hear the word of God over and over again. And seemingly, there's not a lot of movement. I was talking to Brother Joe Lott this morning and about something else. And it, I, I just had a, I had a Bible question. Something I was studying for tonight, I, I texted him and he called me back. He said, I'm gonna, I just, he said, I was driving, I'll just talk to you. And we talked for a few minutes and he made the statement. He said, uh, we just not, uh, well, I'd ask him. I said, we come by a couple of Sunday afternoons ago and uh, did, I said, did y'all have a baptism on Sunday afternoon? He said, no. And uh, got talking and he finally re remembered they had a funeral. They were having a dinner at the church. He made a statement to me. He said, we just hadn't had many lately. He said, just seems like nobody's getting saved. I said, Brother Joe, it's the same way where I am. He said, this caused me to do some self-inspection. I said, well, Brother Joe, Lord willing, that's what I'm going to preach on this morning. Today, I wonder, for those of you that are saved, how much of a burden do you have for those that's lost? When's the last time it really got real to us? As I said earlier, to cry to be crying is, is no good. To cry to try to impress somebody else, it doesn't impress God. But when's the last time the burden in your heart was so heavy that the tears begin to flow? 
I had to do, I had to think back in my mind, you know it had been a while. It had been a, it a while since my heart had be, be, been so burdened and so heavy over lost sinners. You know what I did? I went home that night and I asked the Lord, Lord, you give me a burden. Give me a burden because I don't have it. Now I'm going to tell you something. For the last week and a half, that's been on my heart. Where's my burden? Where's my desire to see sinners trust Christ? You know, there's probably more tears being shed over old yeller than there is over sinners, isn't there? We turn on something on the TV, sad, and we'll, we'll cry about it. We don't cry a lot over sinners. This morning, that ought to reveal to us the condition of our heart, shouldn't it? Where's our heart? Where's our burden? Where it needs to be? Paul said, night and day, for the space of three years, he said, I cease not to warn you. Night and day with tears. It was real to him. It was something that mattered to him. He had the work of God in his heart. His heart. You say, well, preacher, I'm just not an emotional person. I'm not either. I am not an emotional person. My mom and daddy are not emotional people. In our home, there wasn't a whole lot of tears that were shed openly in our home. You say, well, preacher, that, you know, that, that, that just, that, that's the reason why I don't cry. That's the reason I don't shed tears over those that's lost, is I'm just not an emotional person. I understand that. You may not be inherently just an emotional uh, person, but the Bible teaches very plainly that tears that are shed are evidence of a heart that's in the right condition, a heart that's full. I, I may mention that there's a funeral this afternoon that, Lord willing, I, I've got a party in and, and, and we'll leave after church and go back down there. But no doubt there'll be some tears shed at that funeral. Why will there be tears shed at that funeral? Because of people's hearts full. When your heart gets full, it's got nowhere to go than flow through the tears, through your eyes. I think about Jesus in John chapter 11 as he would go to the tomb of Lazarus and he would go there and there would be people weeping and wailing and that he would see, that the Bible says that he, that he looked and he saw Mary and he saw the tears begin to flow down her, her face. He saw the sorrow that was in her heart. And what does it say Jesus did? He wept. And those that were around him made the statement, oh, how he loved him. And I tried to preach concerning that some time ago that they thought that he was crying about Lazarus. And that, there may be something that I think if, if there was anything Jesus was crying about it was the fact that he had to raise him. That Lazarus was going to come back to this earth. But I believe more so that Jesus saw the, 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 the agony. He saw the grief that those sisters, his friends were in and it touched him, didn't it? And he began to cry. And he began to weep. Turn back, if you would, in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 19. When's the last time you shed tears over lost sinners? It may be why we had not seen many saved. You may be in the same shape I'm in. And, and I made this statement that night, that Wednesday night. I didn't hear a lot of other, a lot of other people crying as well. And I can't look into your heart, and I wouldn't try to accuse you this morning that you're hard-hearted, that maybe you come to the place that I had come to, but it may be that way. It may be. Luke chapter 19, verse 41, right before Jesus would go to the cross, it said this, that when he was come near, this is to the city, the city of Jerusalem, he beheld the city and he wept over it. We read in the book of Matthew that he went up there on the Mount of Olives and he overlooked the city. He could see it, and not just the buildings of the city, but he could see those precious people, his own people. And when he beheld the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou had, hadst known even thou, at least this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. What was he speaking of? He was speaking of the fact that if you, if you would have accepted me, oh, if you would have just received me as your Savior, that, that you would have had peace. But he said, the, the 
But I'm going away that these things will be hidden from you. These things will not be available. They will not be accessible. Because he said, the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground. And thy children within thee, and they shall, they, they shall not leave thee in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. You see, Jesus was looking ahead. He was looking ahead to a time some 40 years later when the Roman general Titus would come and he would besiege the city of Jerusalem. That He would go in and destroy the city and he would take a plow and run it over the very land where the temple stood. And when Jesus thought about that, when he thought about those people that had missed their opportunity, it said tears began to flow. He began to weep over them. You see, Jesus is our great example. He looked upon them. He looked in their condition. He looked on the fact that they, that, that they had, had passed up the opportunity. And his heart was full. And he began to weep. And he began to cry. And he wept over that city. You see, our children, our grandchildren... The lost ones that come here, what's going to be their destiny if they don't accept the Lord? It's going to be worse than the wrong ones coming in. And yet, does it grieve us? Does it really touch us? Does it really burden us? In Luke chapter 6, Jesus would make this statement. He said, blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. The word laugh there means that you, you can rejoice. He said, if you'll weep now, he said, there'll be a time of rejoicing. But he went on that chapter and he said, but woe unto you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Church, we're going to weep now or we're going to weep later? We need to weep now, don't we? We need to weep now so that, that, that later we can rejoice rather than just laughing now, than just going about our business and saying everything's okay, well, everything's good, that, you know, that we got a good attendance, we got a, got a good spirit, we got a good attitude. And those are good things, and, and, and that needs to continue. But oh, to be satisfied, it's a terrible place to be. Go to Psalm 126, if you would. I want to just go back through the Psalms and look at some scriptures as we in inspect ourselves this morning. Where's our burden? Where's my burden? I'm thankful the Lord's helped me as I prayed and I, and, I, and, I, and I asked Him, Lord, give me that burden. Give me that that I'm missing. Not for my good, not so people can talk about me, but because I need that burden for lost sinners. Where is it, will you? When's the last time you wept? The tears flowed. Not because you were trying to impress somebody, because your heart was full, your heart was burdened for people dying and going to hell. Psalm 126. It says, when the Lord turned again to captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. You go over to Psalm 137, and even though it's later in the Psalms, you read of what, what, what they were doing when they were taken into captivity. It said, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down. And Brother Gary, it said that they wept when they remembered Zion. They didn't remember Zion and go, oh, shucks. They wept. They hung their harps in the willow trees. It said they required of them a song. They said, how can we sing a song to the Lord in a foreign land? I, I love singing. Y'all know that. I encourage you to sing. But sometimes maybe when we're singing, we ought to be crying. We ought to be weeping. Our hearts ought to be broken. But they wept. And because they wept, he said here in verse 2, he said, now our mouth's filled with laughter. It's rejoicing because the Lord turned again. The captivity is on. He's heard our cry. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Now look at verses 5 and 6. He said, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. I know that's not new to you this morning. 
You've heard that all your life. It's a promise. He said, they that sow in tears, he said, there's going to be a reaping. It's going to be a good reaping. It'll be a joyous reaping. If we'll sow in tears, we'll reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, and shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You know what he's saying here? He says the winner of souls must first be a weeper for souls. If we're going to win souls, we've got to weep over souls. They've got to matter to us. They've got to be important to us. It's got to come from the heart. Go back to Psalm 30. Just a couple more psalms. We're going to try to come to a close. Is it serious with you today? Psalm chapter 30. It said in verse 1, I will extol thee, O Lord. Thou hast lifted me up, hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. This is a time that David was dealing with something in his life that was hard to deal with. Whether it was physical sickness, whatever it was. He said, O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of, of his holiness. For his anger endureth for a moment, and his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. What comes first? It's weeping. He said, weeping may endure for a little while. But he said, when there's weeping, he said, there's going to be rejoicing. And notice when he said, he said, weeping may endure for the night. I was talking, I think it was Brother Allen yesterday as we were up here working, we were talking about how, uh, how that, 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 that Satan has put so many distractions in front of us. And I, and I found myself the same way, maybe lay down at night and you, your, your mind's occupied until the very second that you go, you may go to sleep doing something. I believe we lay down on our night. That's a good time to pray. That's a good time to ponder. That's a good time to meditate. That's a good time to do some self-inspection. He said, weeping may endure for the night. In the stillness and the quietness of the night, our thoughts ought to turn to God. He said, if we'll do that, he said, there's coming a joyful time. He said, that joy will come in the morning. Go back to Psalm 6. Psalm chapter 6. I know I'm just giving you some scriptures. Psalm chapter 6. Again, this is a time when David was going through some sort of trouble. And evidently it was something that, something that had come upon him because of sin, disobedience. And uh, remember, it's not just the sins of commission, but it's the sins of omission. Not just what I've done, but what I hadn't done. And notice what David said, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me for thy bones. My bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. Save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee in the grave. Who shall give thee thanks? Notice how serious it got with David. He said in verse 6, he said, I am weary with my groaning. David was worn out and groaning and crying and praying and mourning. And I tell you what it'll do, it'll wear you out, won't it? To lay there and to cry and to weep because that your, your heart is so burdened, it'll, it'll wear you out. He said, I'm weary with this. He said, all the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with tears. What he's saying there is, is, is this, that he said, my pillow was, was, was covered. He said, it was as I, as I was swimming. 
He said, my bed or my couch is watered with my tears. When's the last time your pillow got watered with your tears because you were burdened about somebody that's lost? It had been too long with me. But David said all the night, make out my bed to swim. Mine eyes consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Listen to this. For the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. What's the song, Tears or Language that God Understands? What is it about tears that moves the heart of God? It's not the tears, it's the heart. Tears may move people. I know people that can do I know people that can, can get up and speak and they can turn it on. They can turn the emotions on and people are moved by that, but that doesn't move God. But when, it, when our heart is full and it's broken and those tears flow down our face, God recognizes that. That's what he wants to see. He says, the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. This morning, I want to challenge the church. I want to challenge you, every one of you this morning. Will you pray with me that our hearts would be broken over lost sinners? Would you pray with me? Not to try to manipulate God. It won't work. We're not going to cry professions of faith. We're not going to cry baptisms. But that our hearts would be broken before God. Tears would be shed. Because we're concerned about folks. We're concerned about boys and girls, men and women that's never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior because of a burden. Today, how, do you have a burden for the lost? You preach, I got a burden for the lost. When time, when's the last time you shed tears over them? Don't tell me you got a burden if no tears have been shed. I'm not talking about necessarily in public. I don't shed a lot of tears in public. I would hesitate to say it, but I'm thankful last night the Lord answered my prayer. And I'm thankful last night that my pillow was watered with my tears. And it got real to me. How is it we this morning, child of God? I believe God's waiting for a burden. And I believe he'll bless when he sees those people down at Lone Star. They where they need to be. A lot of things will get taken care of when we have the proper burden, won't it? Our attitudes, they'll get taken care of. Our priorities will get taken care of when we have that burden that we need to have. This morning, how is it, will you? Do you have that burden? Or have you grown cold? Your heart become hard. That, that's really what it's about, it's, it's having a tender heart. Has your heart become hard? Would you do as I've done? Would you pray, God? Soften my heart. Give me the burden. Sinners are at stake. I believe the coming of the Lord is imminent. You believe that? So said, well, they're young. They got life ahead of them. Well, what if the Lord comes back? I don't preach signs. and Y'all know that. But the things that the Bible points to, and of even the conditions in the last days, and even how the Lord, I know that God's not bound by time, but he said that a day with the Lord says a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. You think about seven days being complete. We've got a thousand years out in front of us. We've got six thousand years. Is it not about time for the Lord to come back? Let's be burdened for sinners. Let's, we'll ask for a song. There'll be something in your heart this morning. Would you come?